All right, thank you. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the 2013 Laser Cataract Surgery Survey. We are very pleased that you've all joined us for today's session. Uh, for, today, for today's call, we've invited teams from the following different categories. The manufacturers who created this amazing technology, the respondents to the survey, uh, both the physicians and their administrators who helped us uh, answer all the questions in the survey itself, and members from 13 different of our esteemed uh, industry trade publications who are will be hosting for a Q&A towards the end of today's session. Now this is the second survey of this kind dedicated completely to femtosecond based cataract surgery, its use and how it's being brought to market across the United States. Our findings last year were critical in uncovering current trends and norms and many providers found the data brought a lot of confidence related to how they plan to set up their programs. Well, this year has been just as anticipated. The data set you're about to see is deeper, meatier, and more complete than any other study related to this rapidly changing category. So again, thanks for listening. Let me take a minute to introduce your presenters for today's session. First off is Sharif Madavi. Sharif is no stranger to our industry, and not only has he been a longtime friend to many of us, he was influential in many of our categories, first elective and refractive offerings, and uh, truly has made LASIK a household term for, uh, for our entire country. He has also been a longtime advocate of the patient experience and, the, and its role throughout the medical process uh, in ophthalmology and other medical categories. Michael Lockman has also been a longtime strategist and data hound in the medical field. He has an incredible reputation for his ability to communicate the most complicated of data sets into accurate and actionable morsels for practices to implement things with. And I'm Matt Jensen, Executive Director of Vance Thompson Vision here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where we just opened a 30,000 square foot clinic and ASC and research institute. In fact, it's one of the first ASCs completely built around the exciting technology that we're going to be talking about today. So without further ado, some of the findings, and I'd like to hand over the microphone and controls over to Sharif Madavi. Sharif? Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everybody, for being on the call. This year's survey uh, was made available to the 134 U.S. lasers that had been installed by the end of last year. We had participation by 65 centers used by over 200 surgeons, and this response rate of 49%, we believe, not only is a great response rate to any survey, but is very representative of what usage patterns look like across the country. Our team, which I want to thank, collected data in March of 2013. Our direct team was 15 people who were on the telephone and fax machines and emails working with the over 200 surgeons and administrators across the country to collect this data in very short order. So thanks to all of you who were involved in that, whether you were on the data collecting side or the data providing side. Average tenure with the laser now is 12 months in this survey, ranging from the newest customers that had just several months of data to those that have been using it in excess of two years. The data that you're about to see covers the time periods of January 2011 through March 2013. Approximately 280,000 cataract cases were reported and over 37,000 laser cataract cases make up this data set. Surgeon averages for number of cataracts done per year is 660 or just over 50 per month and their mix of premium implants, the toric and the presbyopic, you can see here was 22%. Above the national average that we've seen traditionally of that 14 to 15% range, and you would expect that given the nature of uh, these users who are, tend to be earlier adopters. When we quickly show you the uh, comparison between last year's data set, the year one survey, and this year's data set, the year two survey, you can see that everything is expanded anywhere from two to six times, whether it was the number of eligible centers, the number of participating centers, you know, all the way down to the incremental fees that this data represents in terms of what it's contributed uh, uh, industry-wide of now over $32 million. And 
Uh, you can see, for example, that the average cataracts per year has come down a little bit, but we would expect that because even 660 is well above average across all cataract surgeons in this country. Mike? Yeah, so one of the, the metrics that, that we look at to, to characterize the practices that are part of the survey is, is uh, the percentage of IOLs implanted that fall into the premium category. And Sharif already mentioned that that 22% was the percentage from the survey population. And if you look at this data, uh, this covers all two plus years of the survey, all, all of 2011 and 2012 and into the first quarter of 2013. And, and you can see that for 78% of all of the procedures, uh, presbyopic IOLs, 13% uh, and toric IOLs, 9%. Uh, these, these numbers are pretty consistent with what we saw in last year's survey. Last year we saw 77% conventional, so that's, uh, that's shifted up a bit and and uh, TORC is down a couple of points from last year. It was 11% last year. Uh, now looking at, at uh, the three types of, of IOLs and, and looking at the laser penetration into those different procedures, uh, I'd like to point out that this data is, is looking at the first quarter of 2013, not the entire two plus year data set. And the reason we look at the most recent quarter is we want to look at a period uh, in which all of the practices and all the laser users are up and running and not, not compare sort of pre-laser use to with laser use. And, and what we see here is, is that, you know, as you'd expect, the percentage of OL procedures that use the laser is the lowest among the three lens types at 20%. Um, Torque a bit higher at 55%. And again, um, I don't think, uh, this should come as a surprise to, to any of us. The highest percentage of laser uh, procedures are in that uh, presbyopic correcting eye well category at, at 74%. Uh, but if you look at this next slide, uh, what, what we're trying to point out here is the fact that these three pies, conventional, toric, and presbyopic, are not the same size. We're really looking at three different size pies here in terms of the number of procedures that, that you're starting with that make up the, the universe of of procedures, and, and the fact is that, uh, as we pointed out, conventional makes up 78% of procedures. So even though the 20% penetration is lower as a, as a percentage of procedures than the 55 or 74% we see with the two premium IOL categories, when you can take into account the size of that pie and the fact that there are many more procedures, uh, what you see here is that is that 20% of the large pie turns out to be actually similar to or slightly higher than, than 55 plus 74% of these two smaller pies. And if you look at the blended average of uh, the toric and presbyopic, what we found was about a 66% um, combined penetration of the premium IOL procedures. And then looking across all three lens types, the weighted average across across the entire universe of procedures in the latest quarter, it was a 30% penetration. Uh, this is basically the same information, just looking at it in a slightly different way, uh, in the form of, of bar charts. And again, you see where where you know 20% of of the large column ends up being roughly the same size as as you know the 55% and 74% respectively of the two the two smaller columns. And the other, the other bit of information on this slide, uh, obviously, are the hours that we use to calculate these, these penetration rates. Um, and again, these are procedures in the survey that came from the first quarter. And Mike, let me just add a comment here that this is actually very similar to what we saw in the first year of data. In fact, uh, you know, last year was 13% of conventional IOLs, but that was the big surprise a year ago because there were many physicians going into this that thought this was going to just be something used with toric and presbyopic IOLs, but we do see it used with conventional IOLs. Presumably, many of those patients having this also had concurrent astigmatism coming into their cataract surgery consultation. Right. Now, one of the, one of the things that, that we saw from last year's survey that I think came as a surprise to, uh, to some of us was that when we looked at the premium IOL percentage um, within the practices over time, and at the time that was looking at, at data from 2010, 2011, and the first quarter of 2012,
we had expected to see uh, a, a note toward a higher use of premium IOLs, both TORC and presbyopic, particularly presbyopic, um, among this group of users. And we didn't see that. Um, but one of the things that, that we've been hearing over, over the last year is we talk to people in the industry, from, you know, we, we speak with manufacturers and we speak with surgeons involved with, uh, with laser cataract surgery is anecdotally there's a perception that, that the laser is leading toward a greater use of premium IOLs. So this year in the survey, we asked that question directly. We asked the question, you know, has adoption of the laser affected your use of premium IOLs? And you see in the chart on the right, what we found was clearly a positive trend. Only 9% of respondents said that, that the laser has decreased their use of premium IOLs. And then the rest of the group, the other 90 or so percent, were evenly split between no change and increased use. So the survey results uh, were consistent with the anecdotal feedback that we've been getting in recent months about this positive trend. But when you look at the data and we analyze it from the numbers that were submitted by all the surgeons and their practices, what you see is the data not supporting that perception that's been, or, or actually their subjective response in the question that we asked. And what we see here basically is that TORIC IOL basically over the last couple of years have, have remained unchanged in terms of their usage within a laser cataract procedure. Mike and I look at this and say that, you know, 8.8% down to 8.5% is basically flat. It's within the noise level. And similarly on the presbyopic side, which has increased slightly, as we saw in the first quarter, up to 13.6%, but it's within what we would consider the, the, the range of normal fluctuation, and we don't read too much into this in terms of increase or decrease. We basically say that it's remained flat in terms of its usage. And the, the way to interpret this is just to basically say that the usage of premium IOLs has not increased, nor has it decreased as a result of the presence of the laser. But I, I would say that uh, one way to interpret, you know, to square up this information with the previous slide, uh, where clearly there's a perception that, that the premium IOL use is increasing. I think one way to interpret that is, is by understanding or, or thinking about this idea that the laser itself has expanded the premium channel and how surgeons and people in this industry think of the premium channel. It's not just about the IOL anymore. It's about the premium procedure, whether that involves uh, an IOL, the laser, or both or other diagnostics that are associated as uh, the Aura device from WaveTech. Now, what you see here on this slide now is, is just critical. It shows how quickly practices and, and centers are, that are getting the laser are actually using it, how quickly and how often. On average, as Mike had said earlier, right now it's sitting at 30%. 30% of all procedures done in the first quarter in the survey were done with the laser. What we did is we took every center, and you can just imagine, we said, look, the date that you were installed with your laser, we're going to call month zero. And then we normalized every laser so you can see what their first month, month one, month two, month three, and so on with their use. Well, every laser's had it at least one month. So that's why N equals 65. And you can see in the first month, it averaged about 17% of total procedures. But that rapidly escalates and gets over the 25% mark. And then what you see... From month two onward, you see basically um, usage bounce around between 25 and 35 percent of all cataract cases then being done with the laser associated with it. The numbers that you see out there, the ends, decrease over time because at five months, we have N equals 54 centers reporting data. But if you, as you follow this out, the, the N is going to reduce because the number of centers that have had the laser the longest is a very small population. We were able to show data here for nine centers out to uh, one year and eight months. That's month 20. And then you see there as well a trend line, and that's similar to the trend line that we drew last year that indicated that we think that kind of long term, 30%, maybe slightly higher uh, of all the, the cataract cases can, can or will be done with the laser, given the data that we're currently looking at. Right, and, and I, I think one of the ways to think about that 30% number is, is that, uh, and, and it's interesting to note that a year ago when we were 
crunching the numbers from from the first year survey and drawing a similar chart, it was 30% that we had concluded a year ago that was, was sort of where that trend line was heading, and that was the working number that we had used in our discussion last year. Um, I, I think over time it's reasonable to, to believe that as the technology becomes more ingrained and, and you know, becomes more widely accepted, more widely known, I, I think that 30% number moves higher to something north of 30%. But what this chart shows that it's not just number of months with the laser for a particular practice that's going to raise that number up. Correct. Correct. Mike, this is your slide. All right. So, so uh, what we're looking at here, uh, a little earlier we showed the, the mix of, of IOLs considering all of the cataract surgeries. This is just looking at the laser procedures um, over the two plus years. Um, that are covered in the survey, and and we see that conventional uh, IOLs make up almost half of all laser cases at 48%. And it's notable that this this metric a year ago, when we looked at the first set of data, was 41%. So so clearly, from last year's survey to this year's survey, there's a, an even greater trend toward conventional. And I I would think it's fair to say that the 41% number was higher than we were expecting a year ago, and it's gone even higher. Uh, come from presbyopic, which is at 33% a year ago. That metric stood at 38%. And TORIC down a little bit from last year. TORIC represents 19% of, of laser procedures in the universe. And what you see here is, is basically the same set of numbers from the last chart, except uh, expressed out over time. So breaking out that 48% example, of, for example, of the conventional what we see is that in 2011, that, that number stood at 43%, and it increased uh, to 48% in 2012, and in the first quarter of this year stood at 50%. So that's consistent with, with the 2012 to 2013 survey difference, showing that there's a, a trend toward more conventional IOLs. And, and you can see here that, that both presbyopic and toric gave a little ground as a percentage of the total uh, over this time period. So now we want to move from basically how often the laser is being used to how much surgeons and centers are charging for patient to have their cataract surgery done with laser. Let me walk you through this chart. And as you've noticed, what we've done is we're expressing all our data by the type of IOL that gets implanted. Most of the centers out there use three tiers to offer their refractive packages, one that would involve a conventional monofocal IOL, one that would be around astigmatism and could include a toric IOL, and one that would be for, for presbyopic correction and would include one of the three available presbyopic IOLs. And what we've done here is we've shown you the fees that were charged before the laser was present in the lighter blue bar, the fees that were charged once the laser was established and installed, and then that arrow to the right of each grouping of two bars, each pair of bars, shows the difference between before and after or the change in fee. In the conventional, for example, beforehand, uh, sur surgeons and centers on average are charging $428 for that. We'll call it le level one, if you will. Uh, it often included LRI. Some people include the aura in it uh, to do something of a refractive nature in conjunction with a cataract procedure. Now that average fee with a laser present is $1,486 or a net increase of just over $1,000. It is similar, we did similar analysis for the toric and presbyopic levels of refractive packages and what you notice immediately is that the fee increases or the change in fee were not as much for a toric IOL or a presbyopic IOL and that makes sense because they were already charging $1,500 and $2,500 respectively, and so the upward movement or room, if you will, to increase fees was just less. Patients were already paying a good amount of money. Now to have that same IOL used with a laser, they're just, they could only charge between around $650 to $675. When you blend it all together, the blending of those three and, and you put it all in the same pot of soup, it's an $859 weighted fee. And it's important that we describe this as a weighted average because we saw many centers who did not increase their fees in their 
second and third levels of re refractive packages. And what we mean by that, by example, is prior to getting the laser, they may have only offered the toric IOL and the presbyopic IOL, and they didn't have a package. Maybe they didn't do LRIs, didn't have an aura. But now with the laser and with that added equipment, they made changes. And, and it to, by having a, now a new tier one package, but some centers kept their prices, the fees the same. In other words, they didn't increase their fee for a toric or presbyopic package, if you will, once they got the laser. So those freebies, so to speak, are all incorporated as part of the $859 number. We feel it's very representative of, of what's going on in the industry. And Mike, this is just down a little bit over last year. It was in the 900 and uh, mid-950 range. It was, yeah, it was 945 last year. And so the, and, and where the difference came from, you know, the torque and presbyopic incremental fees didn't change much at all. Those, those are very close to where, where they were last year. Uh, the incremental fee for conventional IOLs is down a bit from last year, and, and I would point out that that it, the, the squeeze has happened from both ends. What I mean by that is is not only is the $1,486 fee for conventional IOLs with the laser a bit lower than last year, but the $428 fee uh, for these practices before the introduction of the laser uh, is a bit higher than last year, just meaning that this survey population, on average, uh, more of them were charging for their LRI. LRIs or those types of services uh, beforehand. And it makes sense because a similar survey or a survey that we've done simultaneous to this one that we'll be reporting on next week with Wave Tech Vision and their Aura device is showing that more doctors are now comfortable doing LRIs when they have that intraoperative aberrometry reading during these things all work together to certain extent. Moving on now, this is a slide that shows us the relative contribution where you look at units in terms of IOLs versus incremental fees. So as we noted earlier, over the time period, uh, conventional IOLs are making up 48% of all the laser cataract procedures being done. However, they're contributing more on a percentage basis, 61% of the incremental fees. Again, that makes sense because many uh, centers didn't have a refractive package to begin with for a conventional IOL prior to getting the laser. But it just underscores the importance of what I'll call that base level refractive package in terms of expanding the whole channel and concept of premium refractive cataract surgery. So one of the uh, things that we, we do with this data um, is to look at, at the break-even analysis and the payback for purchases or purchasers of the laser. Uh, one of the issues um, that, that's been front and center with this technology is the cost of the technology. And, and there's been a lot of discussion over, over you know, how long it would take a, a, a purchaser of a laser and a center that, that participates to pay back uh, the investment. So this is something that we've looked at. We looked at it last year and we've updated the uh, um, to work this year as well. Yeah, and before, Mike, before you explain this, let me just point out that last year we had uh, just really uh, one laser that was in the marketplace. So uh, we were able to basically use the price of that laser. We knew, we, and we made some assumptions about what the per use fee would be and what laser and, uh, plus service would look like over a five year period. Uh, but this year we actually asked questions in our survey and got plenty of data. Uh, from well over half the people that responded to the survey about how much they paid for the laser, what their per case costs are, what their service is, and that just gives, makes this a much more robust analysis to help people. And those of you who are who have looked at this, you know with the four manufacturers, there's, there's options now, there's choices, and, and different ways of doing the program. So we think this data is actually uh, very good, and it's actually an improvement over last year, Mike. So go ahead and walk everyone through through the numbers. Right. Uh, yeah, as Reef said, there's there's more actual data in here, uh, and fewer assumptions. So I think this is a more robust analysis than we had a year ago. Uh, the $859 per case revenue came straight out of the survey. We just discussed that number. Uh, this the $327 per case disposable cost was the average uh, reported in the survey, and then, again, that's across all manufacturers. And, and that leads to a per case margin of $532. Uh, it's interesting to note that, that even though the per case revenue, uh, as we discussed, is a bit lower than last year, the per case disposable cost, because of the existence of competition, is, is also lower. 
So that per case margin is actually a couple of percent higher this year than it was in our analysis last year, even though the per case revenue is lower. So that's on the margin side. Now looking at the fixed costs that have to be covered, uh, the laser equipment averaged uh, $38,000 um, in our survey and, and looking at, at service costs for years two and five, because the first year is included uh, typically with the purchase of the laser, uh, adds another $165,000. Uh, leading to a five-year fixed cost of just over $600,000. And we look at a five-year fixed cost, uh, it's, I guess, somewhat arbitrary, but, but we're looking at a five-year payback period, um, which is, I think, typical for this type of equipment. Right. And with this kind of capital expense, you really do need a five-year period to pay it off uh, to be conservative. So taking that, that uh, per-case margin and, and looking at covering that total fixed cost over a five-year period, uh, leads to a, a, a total number of cases to break even of, of 1,134, uh, which is uh, sort of netting everything out. It's actually a lower number of procedures. Uh, I think it's about 17% lower than we saw in our analysis last year. Um, dividing five to get a per year number, you get 227 cases per year to reach this break even level. That equates to 19 cases per month. And then, and then going back to that annual number of 227, if we sort of reverse engineer that number and think about that 30% laser penetration rate that we're seeing um, as an average across the board, uh, what that tells us is that, that if you're doing 227 laser procedures a year and you're doing the average 30% of cases being laser, that says that, that you have to have a total procedure base in your center of 757 cases. So if you recall the number of, of cataract surgeries per surgeon in the survey was 660, what this tells you is that on average you don't need much more than one surgeon per laser, obviously a busy active surgeon, but uh, just over one surgeon per laser on average um, is enough to reach that, that break-even level. That's right. Mike, uh, you know, one of the questions that we are consistently getting throughout the year is, uh, from surgeons who call us is, can I afford this? Well, these are the numbers that we think make for much more robust uh, inputs for the doctor to use, the surgeon to use, and the center to use in terms of getting it. But when you look retrospectively now and you apply this and ask the question, what percentage of our uh, participating 65 centers are actually breaking even, we have this chart to show you as well. Right. So what we see is that using that 19 per month as, a, as the break-even threshold, 71% of, of the procedure of the of the centers uh, by uh, by Q1 2013 are already at that level and and I think it's worth noting that that you know in Q1 13 even though some of the centers in the survey had on on average the laser usage had been 12 months and some of the centers are out two years or more but this also includes uh, you know a healthy number of centers that are in their you know first or second quarter of usage. And already, 71% are at this break-even level. Uh, one asked in the survey is: is what percentage of all of the laser cases that are done on this laser are being reported? And for many of the respondents, what we got was 100% of the data for that laser. But in some cases, uh, people wrote in and said, "Well, this is a sh this is a, a shared laser, or it's an open access laser." We're only reporting 10 or 20 or 50 percent of the volume, and if you look at that, some of the centers that weren't quite at break-even, or at least some of the respondents that weren't quite at break-even, if we consider some of those centers were not reporting the entire volume on that laser, um, that, there's another 5 percent that of, of lasers that would be um, at or better than break-even if the centers had been fully reported. So that's 76 percent. Uh, we took another cut at, at centers that were close to the break-even level, recognizing that, that we're dealing with averages here, and, and there's a range of, of, um, of volumes at which centers could, could break even. So if we look at centers that were doing at least 15 a month, that's another 8%, which left only 16% of, of centers in that first quarter of this year that, that weren't at break-even or even near break-even. And interestingly, what we found was that, that the vast majority of those centers were single surgeon centers. 
Um, that is, uh, lasers that were only being used by one surgeon. And, and this really jumped out as the single greatest uh, risk factor, if you want to call it that, for falling short of break-even volume. Uh, and we kind of highlighted that at the bottom. If you look at, at the percentage of single surgeon centers uh, that had reached this near, near break-even or better level, it was still a majority. It was 59%. 13 of 22 centers that were identified as single surgeon were already at near break even or better, which is still a majority. But when you look at the multi-surgeon centers, it was almost all of them that had surpassed this level. 41 out of 43 were already at this near break even. That's right. And it's important that when we talk about break even or better, that we kind of show you what that looks like on a distribution basis. And here what we've done is we've done a, a form of a histogram. So Along the x-axis, or you see these blocks that basically say the number of cases per month from someone doing fewer than 10 all the way up to a center doing more than 100. And within each major block, you, you see it and its height corresponding to the number of centers that fall into each, we'll call it, uh, monthly case volume using laser cataract. And a lot of them in the middle, they do their 19 to 40 cases per month. There are 15 centers there. And there are 14 centers doing 41 to 60 cases. Uh, the break-in even volume, as we see, as we noted earlier, is 19 per month. The average laser volume in this sample of 65 centers is 57 cases per month, a full factor of three times greater than break-even volume, which is very encouraging. Along the x-axis, just above it, you see the, uh, the vertical bars. That represents, each bar represents one center. So we show you, using a histogram there, the distribution uh, we have a handful, there's seven centers there below 10, but you can see, though, that many centers are well above that 19 per month level. I mean, the vast majority of them, as we said earlier, so we would not want anyone to look at the earlier slide and say, gosh, it's terrible that only 71% of the centers are breaking even. Uh, that's far from the truth. Uh, most of the centers are doing well above break even, and we even have four centers on the far right that literally are off the chart, doing very, very high volumes. There were high volume cataract centers to begin with, and they have figured out how to incorporate the laser as part of their offering. And just on that same 25 to 30% basis, uh, they're doing very high numbers of laser cataract surgery on a monthly basis. Now, also, one of the other questions that we were getting from doctors is, you know, how should they acquire the laser? And as it turns out, just 83% are either buying it or buying it using some type of third-party financing and a, and a structured loan. 7% uh, are doing some type of equipment lease, and 10% are currently doing procedure-based financing where the manufacturer has the ability to basically uh, have this finance as part of usage of other products. I would expect this is going to shift over time as we get deeper penetration and more surgeons and centers get into the market. But... Um, Clearly, and, and as referenced by the pri previous slide in terms of the break-even analysis, uh, surgeons who are getting into this at this point are feeling comfortable just going out and, and buying the equipment to begin with. So capital expense has not been a barrier, even though it's on the same level as it was 20 years ago when we first started selling, and, or 17 years ago technically, when we first started selling the, the eczema laser for laser vision correction. Well, and Sharif, this is uh, Matt talking. That leads to the, the next point, which is many practices aren't doing their own full break-even analysis like this study did prior to being in the hunt for this technology. Some of the business operation questions uh, that we've heard over the years have become so so critical. The the practice optimization and 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 business challenges that surround this technology is is one of many critical components to the whole paradigm. And one of the goals of what we've uh, been working on is to work on the technology transfer part of the work, that is getting it from the doctor's hands and the surgeon's uh, mind uh, implemented through the rest of the practice or surgery center uh, to take this amazing technology and optimize it more quickly than ever and to get out in front of not only the cost, but, uh, but the economic model uh, like some of the earlier slides showed. And, and what we reference here is just a firm that's, been, that's grown out of this industry to help practices do that more quickly. Um, we focus on the best practices that we've learned from our implementation and other key uh, early adopters, a technology transfer and help programs uh, like theirs with the heavy lifting, the scripting, the staff training, the economic modeling, all to, 
to do just what you see in front of you, handle some of the strategy, the training, the flow and demand creation, and on and on for this uh, uh, exciting but complicated technology. And we do that because if you run to the, to the next slide here, um, what, what doctors do want to know and what, what we all want to know is what, whether or not we've done the full break-even analysis. We do uh, have a gut, and, and this is what we reported at the practice level or the uh, surgery center level, was our return on investment. And so this is a, a percentage of respondents who said that um, the technology has already helped pay for itself. So this is self-reported. And what you see here again is a vast majority of the respondents saying that yes, they are, uh, their gut check is that they are way out front of their, of their model to the tune of uh, you know, much higher than 80% than there with, with only 14% saying that it's um, too early to tell and a, a small 2% concerned about um, whether or not they're out in front of the technology. If you go to the, to the next model there, you can see that this also has an effect on uh, what the industry has keyed in on and, and what practices do as well. Uh, key in on as, um, as a quality indicator is the practices willingness to recommend this technology to their group of peers. And the question very literally asked, given your experience to date, how likely are you to recommend to your peers that they get involved and begin performing laser cataract surgery? And what we found is that 83% are likely to recommend, that's with a six rating or higher, uh, and, and with those who, who don't being really on the fence um, and very few respondents below the five mark. And so again, that all ties back to once the technology is in hand and, and it's being used at the practice level, the optimization and business operations part of the equation. Matt, thank you. And let me just echo that, you know, having a firm like Spectacle, which is comprised of people who are working as administrators and practices, uh, practice development consultants, strategists, analysts, it's a nice network that, that's gotten together and, and is supported by all the manufacturers because all of us together, doctor, uh, uh, surgeon, administrator, manufacturer, analysts, marketing people, we all want this new category to prosper and do well. It is an absolutely wonderful technology, uh, but it needs to be rolled out in a certain way. So having some additional support and services in the background is very helpful. To summarize, before we get to the, uh, the media question and answer part of the, of the session, the femtosecond laser is expanding what we think of in terms of the premium channel now moving beyond that 14 to 15 percent where the premium channel in the in the traditionally was defined by what type of implant you were putting in either a torque or a presbyopic implant and is now expanded to really include the laser and other diagnostics conventional IOLs are key this is the key to expansion there's many more consumers you know the vast majority are having a conventional monofocal IOL put in and it's accounting for about half of current laser procedures and a majority of the fees the incremental fees that are being generated by use of the laser. Practices, once they get the laser, are ramping up very quickly in the first several months, getting up into that 25 to 35 percent band and averaging 30 percent of all their procedures being done with the laser. And overall, given the return on investment analysis, the break-even analysis that we've done and what doctors are reporting, there's an encouraging financial outlook with many lasers, you know, the average volume being three times uh, the break-even rate, and, and many lasers, most of them exceeding that, uh, not only break-even, but doing very well. Most of the single surgeon centers, meaning the majority, and it's just the slight majority, are achieving at least near break-even, but all the centers, basically, who have multiple surgeons using it are doing so. And I do want to take a nod right now to Alcon, Bausch & Lomb, Lenzar, and Optimatica. I want to thank them for stepping up and supporting, in fact, making this survey possible because without their financial support, we wouldn't have been able to assemble the team that has put together this data in a very, very short period of time. And it really is exemplary of industry and the profession working together. And I also want to thank the several hundred surgeons and administrators that provided their data to, to pull it into the data set because what we see now in just the second year of availability in the U.S. that we are already penetrating with laser, 2.3 coming up on 3% of all the U.S. cataract procedures, and that's phenomenal for a new start uh, technology that's gone on there. And just to put it in context, when the femtosecond laser first came out to make flaps in LASIK, it was at that 1, 2, 3% in its first years as well. So I think when I, when I kind of fast forward on a trajectory and, and take the experience of a decade ago 
and where and and with uh, the interlays to begin with and see where this could go. Uh, it's a very very bright future. So I'm encouraged by that and uh, look forward to working with our team uh, to continue to monitor this over the coming years.